Hi everyone, Professor Gassimi here. This week we're going to be discovering modeling text as a sequence. Last week we discussed this idea of embeddings and neural language models. Remember that an embedding was just a way of taking a word or a token in some text and representing it as a vector. And when we covered neural language models, all that was was a way of taking some very simple models like sigmoids and stacking them together to come up with models that were more flexible and could do a better job approximating a relationship between some inputs and some outputs that we might care about. Now, the last lecture sort of wrapped up our discussion about text representation and classification, and we're now moving into um, topics that are regarding natural language understanding. The first of those topics is how we model text as a sequence. We're going to be covering in this lecture specifically hidden Markov models, maximum entropy Markov models, and recurrent neural networks. I wanted to make a quick note about your upcoming project deadline. Um, I know that this co-occurs with your homework assignment. There are no formal grades that I will be giving on your project milestones. I ask you to basically turn in something at each of those project milestones because I want to keep you on track towards accomplishing the project by the end of the semester. But if, for example, by the 25th of the month, you don't have a lot done for the project, that's okay. You can just put whatever you've managed to accomplish, um, given sort of the lull days that we've folded into the semester, and um, I'll give you feedback wherever you're at at that moment. Okay, so let's begin with a conversation about the sequential meanings of words. Remember that at the end of the previous lecture, we discussed how we could use word to vec to represent individual words as a function of the context they show up in. So for example, we could have uh, an embedding dimension, and we could sort of place a bunch of words as a single point within a two-dimensional space if we chose our embedding dimension to be two dimensions. And the ultimate purpose of this contextual embedding was to identify a numerical representation of the words that would place similar words closer. So for example, bad is close to horrible and different words further apart. So bad is further away from good than, than bad is from horrible, for example. Now, obviously, each of these words has a numerical vector associated with it. So bad, for example, could be the vector 1, 2. Horrible could be the vector 2, 2.5. The same goes for every other point within this space. Now, once we have these embeddings, we can represent our sentences as a sequence of vectors, right? We can take, for example, the very simple sentence, not bad, well done. We can go and we can collect the vector representation for the word not, which is 1.56, followed by the vector representation for bad, for well, and for done. And we will have constructed a matrix or an array that will be n by d, where n is the number of words and d is the number of um, embedding dimensions that we chose to embed our text within. Now, obviously, what will happen, because sentences have different lengths and texts all have different lengths, is that different sentences are going to have different values of n, and therefore the matrices that we develop to represent these sentences are going to be different sizes. But notice that there are bound to be some sentences with the same tokens, but with different meanings due to only the order of the words. So for example, if we come and compare these two matrices um, here, not bad, well done, and done bad, not well, if we sort of swap the rows around to the first matrix, we could create the second matrix. And what that means is that, you know, obviously, while the content of the two matrices is the same, it's not just the content, it's the order of the words as well that matters. And this is a property of text, right? The order of words conveys meaning in the same way that um, the context conveys meaning. Now, how can we use this data for making predictions about sequences or their individual components? Or another word is, how do we feed this data into a model if we want to make a prediction using it? Well, one simple thing you could do is you could just flatten out 
the input representation, right? So not, for example, was a two-dimensional embedding, 1.56, and bad was a two-dimensional uh, embedding, 1, 2. And what we could do is we could take this, we flatten it out so that we have a, a 1 by 4 vector, and that gets fed into a neural network to predict some output that we might care about. For example, whether a movie review was good, given that we saw the text not bad. Now that would work well if we only ever had two words that we were classifying at a time, but what would we do if we had sentences of different sizes? For example, well done, not bad. How do we go about integrating this information uh, without training a brand new model, one that's catered to four words, one that's catered to three words, and, and so on, which could get onerous very quickly? Well, a simple solution is to just take a sliding window over the text and to aggregate our results at the very end. So for example, we could start off with the text not bad, and we could compute the probability that a review is good given the text not bad. And this could be, for example, 70%. Okay, and then we're going to just slide that text over. So you can see not bad has now, we've sort of just bumped the vectors over by one. And we're going to now compute, given the text done not, the probability that the review is good up here at the top. And let's say that's 50%. We bump one more time. We have the text well done now. And we can once again compute the probability that the review is good given this bigram, and let's say it's 90%. Well, well, now we have something that's sort of gone across the bigrams, and it's at the sequence level created an annotation, right? For each of the bigram kind of pairs, we have uh, a label that's associated with it. Now, one thing we could do is we could naively aggregate these predictions by taking their mean. But this would ignore sequential information outside the context window, and it might also wrongfully um, make assumptions about independence between the context. So for example, uh, the probability of good given not a terrible movie would become the probability of good given not A, the probability of good given a terrible, and the probability of good given terrible movie. Well, these two terms, a terrible and terrible movie, are probably going to carry a lot of weight, right? They're going to say, this is definitely not a good movie. And not A on its own probably doesn't say much because the context isn't enough to, to help me understand what, what this not actually refers to. So you could see how, depending on the size of the context window, you could easily encounter problems here. And of course, this can become even worse if you uh, make the context window a size of one, right? You're only dealing with individual tokens. For example, if you have the sentence, well done, not bad, and your context size is one, then well, the probability of good given well done, not bad will become actually equal to the probability of good given done bad, not well, right? Because you're just taking an average across these probabilities. So what we really need if we want to solve this problem effectively are methods that can handle sequences that are of varying lengths and that explicitly account for the temporal aspects of language. That is, we want to move beyond just thinking about context in terms of windows to context in terms of, you know, the sequence of things that preceded this particular incident.